well, good morning, everybody. Let's see, is the mic working okay? All right, praise the Lord. Well, let's take our Bibles, if we could, and open them to the book of Revelation. Chapter 3 and verse 10. The book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 10. The title of our message this morning is Kept from the Hour. Kept from the Hour. And uh, we have been working our way through the book of Revelation. We have been looking at the things that our Lord has been saying to the church at Philadelphia. And right in the middle of his exhortation to the church at Philadelphia, we read these words. Jesus says, because you have kept my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And what we've just entered into is one of the most hotly uh, debated verses, not only in the book of Revelation, but perhaps in the whole Bible. So as God allows it, we're going to be spending all of this morning here on verse 10, and we still might not even finish it. But notice, if you will, the first part of that verse, notice what the Lord says. He says, because... You have kept the word of my perseverance. I will keep you from the hour of testing that is to come upon the whole world. That raises sort of an interesting question, doesn't it? Well, what if I don't do my part? What if I'm not persevering enough? A lot of people will tell you, well, if you're not persevering enough, then you miss the rapture which is what the rest of this verse is I'll be revealing to you, teaching you this morning, indicates. There is a view out there, and some of you may be familiar with the rapture debate, some may not. But there is a view out there called the partial rapture theory. And I, I can't tell you how many Christians I know struggle because they've been taught this theory. The partial rapture theory goes something like this. Well, you better be living holy and righteous because if the Lord comes at a specific instant when you're not living holy and righteous, for example, you're in that movie theater watching a movie that you shouldn't be watching and the rapture occurs at that point, you're going to be left right there in your seat and you're going to be, to quote the late Tim LaHaye, left behind. It's called partial rapture theory. And so the partial rapture theorist basically argues that the purpose of the tribulation period, which is going to be described as we move through the book of Revelation, is to straighten out those carnal Christians, partial rapturism. This verse, Revelation chapter 3 verse 10, is a key verse that they use to argue for partial rapturism. Let me just make some generic comments about partial rapturism first before I show you what I think is a proper way to interpret verse 10. What are some problems with partial rapturism? Well, number one, every divine blessing that we have is by God's grace. Even including your spiritual gifts, your salvation. And so that would also include and encompass part of what I like to call the grace package, your participation in the rapture. Beyond that, we have some problems with what we call symbolic parallels. You take the situation of Lot. You know, Lot in the Old Testament, the best I can tell, doesn't really look like a believer at all. But he is called a believer in the New Testament. He's called a righteous man. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, positionally righteous, but he wasn't practicing it. And when you study Genesis 19, verse 22, what you'll learn is the angel that came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, even to backslidden Lot. Are you a lot like Lot? 
we can backslide, can't we, in the Christian life? The destroying angel came and said, I cannot, he didn't say I will not, I cannot, Genesis 19 verse 22, destroy Sodom until you are removed. God cannot bring the tribulation period upon the earth until all his blood-bought people are removed. Beyond that, the promise of the rapture is mentioned in Paul's letters to the Corinthian church. Now, do we know anything about the Corinthian church? Some have called uh, 1 Corinthians 1 Californians because of the backslidden nature of that church. And yet, what does Paul say when he talks about the rapture to that church? 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51, we will what? All be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. He never says, well, you know, you better be living right or you're going to be left behind. Beyond that, if the Lord were to rapture some people and leave others behind, what would that do to Christ's body? It would divide it. Something that can't happen. And beyond that, it would subject certain believers to God's wrath. You see, the carnal folks, according to this theory that are left behind, will go into the wrath of God, and the wrath of God is there to get them straightened out. The problem with that is we are told, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 10, that we are exempted from the wrath of God. Partial rapturism, when you think about it, makes the Bema Seat judgment of rewards unneeded. You see, following the rapture of the church, we will stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ and we'll, we will either be given rewards or deprived of rewards. Our salvation is not an issue at that point. Based on how we allow the Lord to express himself through us during our life in Christ. Now, think about this for a minute. If only the pure Christians living right are raptured, and then the point of the tribulation period is to straighten out all of the impure Christians. And they, according to this theory, get raptured to heaven one by one as they get straightened out in their daily life. Then there would be no point, really, in the Bema Seat judgment. There would be no deprivation of reward for a Christian that's not living holy because at that point everyone will be living holy. Beyond this, partial rapturists are very, very biased. Many of them will teach this theory that the holy Christians are taken, the unholy Christians are left behind, and everybody I've ever encountered that teaches this theory assumes that they are the ones that are going to be taken. And somehow it's the rest of us that are going to be left behind. And if I had some time to go into this theory, partial rapturists misapply verses constantly. They take verses aimed at rewards and apply it to the rapture. They take verses aimed at Israel and apply it to the rapture. And so that's just sort of a synopsis, if you will, of partial rapturism and why we as saints here at Sugarland Bible Church reject that theory. Now, if the theory is to be discarded, then what in the world do we do with verse 10 of Revelation 3, which says, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will keep you from the hour of testing that is about to come over the whole world. I mean, it reads, does it not, like there's a condition that has to be met in the life of the child of God other than faith alone in Christ alone in order to participate in the rapture. And because the verse reads this way, it has always bothered me for a number of years as to how to interpret this particular verse but fortunately, through the Chafer Theological Seminary Journal, I came upon the writings of John Niemela, a Greek scholar. And let me share his findings with you and see if this doesn't fit better with our theology. Niemela, in his journal article, I have it cited there at the bottom of the screen, makes some important points. He says, here are some things that are not part of the original Greek manuscripts. Chapter divisions, verse divisions, 
punctuation marks like periods or commas or exclamation points. And we say, well, how did that stuff get in there? Why do we have chapter divisions, verse divisions, periods, uh, exclamation points? Well, those are added later by copyists of the original manuscripts, but they were never part of the original manuscripts. And so what happens is most English translations separate the two verses, verses 9 and 10, with a period. In other words, the way it reads in most, most English translations, including the New American Standard Bible, which is the version I use, you have a statement made by Christ about people coming, and we covered it last week, that will one day bow, the enemies of Philadelphia will bow before the feet of the Philadelphians. And then in your English version, probably what it has is a period, and then it begins verse 10 with a capital letter because, and it makes it look like the because is a condition to participate in what follows in verse 10, the rapture. And John Niemela's point is simply this, those punctuation marks and commas and exclamation points and chapter divisions and verse divisions, those really are not part of the original text. But most people think they are, and thus it becomes a cause in the minds of many people for participating in the rapture. John Niemela in his article makes the very simple point that the period is placed in the wrong place. If you're going to place the period somewhere, you don't place it at the end of verse 9. You should place it in the middle of verse 10. So the passage would read as follows. See, I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you, the sentence continues, because you have kept my enduring word, period. And then what follows is an unconditional promise. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is about to come upon the whole earth. In other words, what he's saying is the condition becomes a cause not for participating in the rapture, but a cause for their enemies to bow down at their feet as described in the prior verse. In other words, your enemies are going to come down and bow at your feet one day because you have been obedient to me. End of idea then the idea starts afresh and he begins to talk about the unconditional promise of the rapture of the church. That way, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, the second half of the verse becomes an additional, unconditional promise of the rapture. A promise that God unconditionally gives to the child of God regardless of daily life or daily performance. You see, your daily life and daily performance as a Christian is going to be evaluated at the Bema Seat Judgment. The rewards that we will receive or not receive are very much conditioned. But that's not true with your participation in the rapture. The rapture is coming and if you are in Christ, whether Paul says asleep or awake, you're going in the rapture. You might even go kicking and screaming but you're going nonetheless. Now, why does John Niemela think this way? He thinks this way because he says this, it's rare to begin a sentence in Greek with the word because. It's the Greek word hate. And he says instead hati because when causal in function usually follows a promise rather than something that precedes a promise. So the condition is not for participating in the rapture. The condition is whether the enemies of the church at Philadelphia will bow down before that church. Because they've kept their condition of obedience, that will become a reality. Then he starts a brand new idea about the unconditional nature of the rapture.
So John Niemöller writes, Thus Greek sentences rarely begin a sentence with the phrase, because you have, when explaining the cause or reason for something, as Greek and English texts of Revelation 3 verse 10 unfortunately do today. Instead, the because phraseology consistently follows later in the sentence. And so you say, well, the NASB doesn't do it this way. The NKJV doesn't do it this way. Are there any English translations out there that do follow what you're talking about? And in fact, there is a translation that does that. It's called the McDonald's idiomatic translation, an English translation, MIT for short. And notice what they do here. The sentence reads as follows, I will put at your disposal those from the synagogue of Satan who call themselves Jews but are lying. See, I will make them come down before your feet, bow down before your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. Why? We have a condition that's been met. Because you have kept my enduring word. And then what should follow is a period, meaning end of idea. And then Jesus, out of his goodness, reminds the church at Philadelphia of a promise that they have that is not conditioned on human performance at all. The rapture. The fresh idea starts right there in the middle of verse 10, which says, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is to come upon the whole earth. And I discovered Dr. John Niemöller's writings on this. I couldn't tell you how excited I was. I'm probably more excited about it than you are. And that's why you guys are sort of uh, victims and guinea pigs of some of the insights I find. But it resolves something for me that has always bothered me. I knew that the rapture was something that was unconditional in nature, but it looked like verse 10 provided a condition when in reality John Nemo is saying there is no such condition for the rapture. The condition is for what precedes not for what follows. And if Dr. John Niemela is right, and if the MIT translation is correct, then probably the very last verse that a partial rapturist could ever use is demolished. The, gr the rapture, participation in it, is by divine grace. That's kind of a heavy way to start for the first 15 minutes on a Sunday morning, isn't it? No jokes, no poetry, just get right into the Greek grammar. But let's take a look here at the second part of verse 10. And let's see if we can explain this. It's an unconditional promise, as we've said. What exactly is being promised? What does Jesus say to the little struggling church at Philadelphia? He says, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that hour which is to come upon the whole world. What is this talking about? And as you probably know, there's a big debate on this. Is this talking about being sustained through the tribulation period? Many people argue that. Or is this talking about not being protected or sustained through the tribulation period, but kept out of that time period entirely? That's the debate. That's why I've entitled this message, Kept from the hour, not kept through the hour, kept from the hour. As you probably know, there are many debates about the rapture of the church. When does the rapture take place relative to the tribulation period? In fact, there's so much acrimony on this, you feel like you're in the tribulation period itself, trying to navigate your way through all these debates. But at the top of the screen, we hold to what we think is the correct view, pre-tribulationalism. We will not see any part of that hour. We'll be removed before that time period even starts. But beneath it, and here it is on graphic form, you have mid-tribulationalists. People that believe that we're going to be here for the first half of the tribulation period. Post-tribulationalism, people that believe that we're going to be here for the whole tribulation period. And if all of this wasn't complicated enough, along comes another view in the 1990s, pre-wrath rapturism, they call themselves, 
which I think is a very misnamed title because pre-tribulationalism is uh, pre-wrath. We think the wrath of God is the whole tribulation, but they say, no, it's the final 25% of it. So therefore, the church will be here for roughly 75% of the tribulation period. Comfort one another with these words. <laughs> and... You know, the rapture question, the rapture discussion may be something completely new to you. What I'd like to convince you of, by God's grace, is I want you to leave here with, with certainty. Belief, conviction, that Revelation 3 verse 10, along with a plethora of other verses, is talking about the top view at the top of the screen that I had earlier, pre-tribulationalism. We are going to be kept out of this time period entirely. Why do I think that? This is going to be a fast Bible study, right? No, because there's 11 questions we have to ask and answer. So let's see if we can look into this a little bit more carefully. The first reason why I think we will not be here for any part of this tribulation period is this. If God were to communicate that we are going to be sustained through the tribulation period, protected through the tribulation period, there were other obvious ways for him to get across this point. Ronald Showers puts it this way, a pre-tribulationalist. He says, the idea of the saints being shielded from the testing while living within or through this time period also would have been expressed more clearly through the use of another preposition, either in, meaning in, or dia, meaning through. Two words, by the way, that aren't found in Revelation 3, verse 10. Thus, I will keep you in or through the time period of testing rather than what the Lord uses, what John records to describe this, the Greek preposition ek, which we'll make reference to in a minute. It wouldn't say ek, which means out of. It would have a completely different preposition in or through, but Revelation 3 verse 10 doesn't say that. So you might be able to interpret Revelation 3 verse 10 as you're going into the tribulation period, but there's a lot easier ways to communicate that had that been the Holy Spirit's intention. Question number two. Will God actually protect believers during the tribulation period? In other words, if Revelation chapter 3 verse 10 means that God will protect believers in the tribulation period, then quite frankly, he does a terrible job of it. Because as we progress through the book of Revelation, what do we see over and over again of the believers that come to Christ in that time period? We see rampant martyrdoms. A lot of people look at this as it's going to be sort of like it was in the days of Moses in Goshen, where the plagues came upon the land of Egypt, but God's people protected in the land of Goshen were supernaturally protected. A lot of people envision it like is, is going to happen in Exodus 9 verse 6. So the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died, but of the livestock of the sons of Israel, no one died. So they say, look, we're going to be in it, but we're going to be protected from the judgments. And there are, quite frankly, a couple of examples where that does happen. Revelation 9, verse 4, you'll see God's people shielded from a certain judgment. Revelation 16, verse 2, God's people are shielded from a certain judgment. But let me tell you something. That is not what the book of Revelation, by and large, is talking about. In fact, Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11, talks about massive martyrdoms. And it talks about the martyrs under the altar crying out to God for justice. What happened to the divine protection of them during the tribulation period? In fact, John sees in Revelation 7, verses 13 and 14, a group of martyrs that's so large... They can't even be numbered. Revelation 13 and verse 10 says, If anyone 
is destined for captivity. To captivity he goes. If anyone is killed with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is calling for the perseverance of the saints. The saints are being killed over and over again in the book of Revelation. You'll see the same thing in Revelation 13 verse 15. Revelation 20 verse 4. I mean, if the idea is God is protecting his people through the tribulation period, not only is that a very weird way of communicating that, but God himself really isn't doing much of a job. And beyond that, how in the world do you interpret the promises of comfort? Every time the rapture is introduced, I think it's introduced for the first time in the upper room, John 14, verse 1, Jesus starts to describe the rapture. And what does he say? Do not let your heart be troubled. Does that statement really make any sense if you're going to go into the tribulation period and be martyred? Oh, by the way, guys, you're going to go through the tribulation period. A lot of you are going to be killed. But don't let your heart be troubled. Comfort one another with these words. How is that exactly the blessed hope of the church? There's a third question that has to be asked and answered to come to some kind of certainty on this subject of the rapture based on Revelation 3 and verse 10. What in the world does it mean when it says Jesus is going to keep you, Philadelphia, from the hour of trial? Notice what Christ says, because you have kept my word, I will also keep you. Now that's the Greek preposition ek. From the hour of testing, which is to come upon the whole world. There is a great battle over that preposition ek. Charles Ryrie writes this. Post-tribulationalists say that from or ek refers to the protection of the church within the tribulation. Pre-tribulationalists, that would be us, understand it to mean the preservation by being absent from the time of tribulation. One is internal protection while living through the tribulation. The other is external protection, being in heaven during that time period. Which meaning does from or ek support? The answer is either if the preposition is considered by itself. But for the record, let it be said that ek does denote a position outside something. Something without. The pre-tribulationalist understanding of Ek is supported by a number of verses that have nothing to do with the rapture and therefore do not beg the question. Let me show you a few other verses on this. But here, you remember Matthew 7 verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. That's the preposition Ek. It means removal. It can certainly mean that in many, many contexts. And what I want you to see in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10 is there's three things. Number one, keep. That's the verb toreo. Number two, ek. That's the preposition from. And number three, the hour of testing. So let's see, shall we, if we can find that same threefold combination elsewhere in the Bible. In fact, it occurs quite frequently. Notice Acts 15, verse 29. That you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornications. If you keep, now that's our same verb, verb toreo, This one is dia tereo, which just adds a little intensification, but it's the same verb. If you keep yourselves free, that's out of such things, you will do well. Notice that ek and dia tereo are used together in a combination communicating, get away from these things sacrificed to idols. He's not saying enjoy these things 75% of the time. He's saying get away from them completely. That same combination is found in Revelation 3 verse 10. Relative to the hour of trial that's soon coming upon the whole earth. Or how about this one? John 12 verse 27. This one's interesting because John is writing, just like the book of Revelation. 
Jesus is speaking, just like our passage in the book of Revelation. And it talks also about an hour of divine wrath, the time period when the Son of God paid the full penalty for our sins. And the same combination shows up. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save, sozo, very similar to tereo, save me from ek, save me from what? This hour, the time of your wrath, And of course, that's a prayer request the Lord never answered because as we know, Jesus bore the wrath of a holy God, the Father, in our place. But you notice what Jesus is praying here through this same threefold combination. He's not saying, I want to go through half of the crucifixion or three quarters of the crucifixion. He's saying, in my humanity, I want to be kept out of it completely. Now that's the same threefold combination of ek, a similar verb, and a time of wrath that's employed in Revelation 3 verse 10. Jesus is not telling us we're going through part of it, half of it, three quarters of it, all of it. He's saying you're going to be out of it completely. Or how about this combination, Colossians 1 verse 13. He rescued, riomai, very similar to keep, He rescued us from, ek, rescued us from what? The domain of darkness. When you placed your personal faith in Christ, your whole position changed. You were taken out of the domain of darkness. As a Christian, you're not 75% saved. You're completely out of the domain of darkness. That same combination is used in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. How about this combination? Now, if you're dealing with mid-tribulationalists, post-tribulationalists, they're going to take you to John 17, verse 15 at some point. What does John 17, verse 15 say? I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep, that's our same verb, from, or ek, that's our same preposition, from the evil one. Now, non-pre-tribulationalists come along and they'll quote John 17, verse 15, and they'll say, look, there it is, the same combination, tereo plus ek, and here Jesus is saying you're going to stay in the world. In fact, uh, John Piper, who is a big denier, if you will, of the doctrine of pre-tribulationalism, uses this verse to support his view. He made this statement when the Nicolas Cage movie came out, featuring left-behind pre-tribulationalism, he was trying to debunk it before it got out of the gate. This is an interview that he gave. John Piper believes that the main scripture which some believers support, the pre-tribulational rapture viewpoint, Revelation 3 verse 10, our passage, does not necessarily mean that believers will be taken away from the earth However, it could mean that God will keep or protect his people from evil during the tribulation period. Notice here he is citing Revelation 17 verse 15. So you have to look at Revelation 17 verse 15 carefully. What are we being kept out of in Revelation 17? Or excuse me, John 17 verse 15. What are we being kept out of? What's the promise? To be kept out of the domain of the evil one. That's the promise. Would you say that when you got saved, you are completely kept out of the domain of darkness in terms of your position? Does God sort of leave you 75% in Satan's kingdom? He may leave us on the earth to do his will, but as far as our position is concerned, we are 100% changed. We are 100% removed from the influence of Satan and into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's why 1 John 5 and verse 18 says, We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who has been born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. Did you know that as a child of God, Satan himself doesn't even have the ability to wage war on your soul without divine permission? Ask Job about that sometime when you get to heaven, when God lowered the hedge of protection. 
Why would 1 John 5 verse 18 say this? Because it's saying we are 100% changed, 100% kept out of Satan's domain, even though we remain physically upon the earth. And so when John Piper uses John 17 verse 15 to argue for post-tribulationalism, I don't think he's understanding the verse. That verse, which is the same combination of ek and tereo, means we are kept out of that time period entirely. So what is the meaning of keep you from? See, that's the debate. When you track down the same preposition with the same or similar verb, what you'll see over and over in God's word is it's a promise not to be sustained through something, but to be kept out of it entirely. Well, what exactly are we going to be kept out of? This takes us to number four. What is the meaning of the hour? Revelation chapter 3 verse 10, Jesus says, because you have kept my word of my perseverance, I will keep you from the hour of testing. Now, the Greek word for hour here is aura. And in John's writings, an hour does not refer to a literal 60 minutes. The way John uses the word typically is it's referring to an age, an extended period of time. For example, we already saw, didn't we, earlier Jesus in John 12, 27 saying, Father, keep me from this hour. He's not talking about 60 minutes. What he's talking about is the ordeal of experiencing the wrath of God during the crucifixion. And you'll notice that what Jesus says to the church at Philadelphia is you're going to be kept out of not just the hour or a hour, but the hour. Do you see the definite article there in front of hour or aura? So John and Christ must be referring to something very well known in biblical history. The hour obviously refers to something that's very concrete in the minds of the Bible-believing Christian. And the only explanation we would have for the hour is the tribulation period it's itself. Because the tribulation period has been well-defined, has it not, in the pages of the Old Testament. Daniel 12 and verse 1 says there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Jesus spoke openly about this time period in Matthew 24, verses 15 through 22. Because he uses our, an extended age, and the definite article in front of the word our, he's referring to something already well-defined, which is the tribulation period. Now, I want, to, I want you to watch this very carefully. Because the argument that is being made today is that this hour, the wrath of God doesn't start until later. Mid-tribulationalists mid say the wrath of God doesn't start until the second half. Three-quarters rapturists say the wrath of God doesn't start until the final 25%. We believe that the whole thing is the wrath of God. And I'll be showing you very carefully as we move through the book of Revelation why that is so. So a lot of people are out there saying, you better, you better hunker down. You better get some ammo. And by the way, having a gun is not a bad thing to have. I, I believe in making preparations like that in my home because we live in a fallen world. I just don't do it because of my eschatological position. I don't do it because I think I'm going to eyeball it with the Antichrist one day. And so much of the body of Christ is living on the edge because they're in improper doctrine and they think they're going to see the Antichrist face to face so I've got to get the copper bullets and all of these things that they sell on the internet. And by the way, there are people out there, I'll, I'll give you one name, uh, Alex Jones, in his, I don't want to call it a ministry, it's his platform called Infowars.com, I think it is. It's all about one world conspiracies. 
And a lot of it, you know, I listen to him and I think, well, he's, he's right in a lot of this stuff because there is coming a one world government on planet Earth. But if you listen to him long enough, which I don't really recommend you do, <laughs> he'll start bashing the pre-tribulational rapture, attacking it over and over again. And you have to ask yourself, why does he keep attacking the pre-tribulational rapture over and over again? Here's the answer. He sells survival gear. <laughs> so pre-tribulationalism would damage his sales. You see that? It's about, as, it's about as simple as that. But what is being spoken of here by Jesus? Let's pretend that the wrath of God doesn't start until the final 25% or the final 50%. Did you catch the statement that Jesus made here? He doesn't promise us we're going to be kept from the wrath. He, he promises us that we're going to be kept out of the time when that wrath is poured out. The promise is you're going to be here for most of it, but not the wrath. The promise is you're exempted, and that's why I entitled this sermon, Kept from the Hour, from the whole hour of this time period. Charles Ryrie puts it this way. However, the promise of Revelation 3 verse 10 not only guarantees being kept from the trials of the tribulation, but being kept from the time of the tribulation. The promise is not, I will keep you from trials. It is, I will keep you from the hour of the trials. But how clear and plain is the promise? I will keep you from the hour of testing. Not just from any persecution, but from the coming time that will affect the whole earth. Charles Ryrie says, the only way to escape worldwide trouble is not to be on the earth. And not just from the events, but from the time. And the only way to escape the time when the events take place is to not be in a place where time ticks. That's why we can't be on the earth during this time, because there's time on the earth. We have clocks and watches. We have to be transported into a place that's timeless, i.e. heaven. He says the only place that meets these qualifications is heaven. Now you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I've been listening to your teachings on Israel and the kingdom, and you keep talking about how the nation of Israel is going to go through this time period. In fact, here's Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Now this is the, what's called the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it uses the same words relatively the same words that we find in Revelation 3 verse 10. Alas, that time is great. There is none like it. It is a time of Jacob's distress. By the way, who is Jacob in the Bible? Israel. But he will be saved from it. Now here it's not ek, but it's apo, very similar preposition. Sozo and apo. Sounds like a computer company, doesn't it? And people say, well, you're telling us that the church is going to be removed from this time period, but now you're telling me that the same, nearly the same construction is used in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, and Israel is going into this time period. And the answer to that is you have to understand the distinction between Israel and the church. If you do not keep Israel and the church separate as separate programs of God, you're going to be confused about this until your dying day. Israel's program is to go into this time period in unbelief so that a remnant can be brought to faith. In fact, Zechariah 13, 8 and 9 is very clear that it's a third of the nation that will be part of that remnant. So they're going from unbelief to belief through the mechanism of the tribulation period. But let me ask you something. Can you be a Christian and not be in faith? It's impossible. It's possible to go to church and not be saved. But what I'm talking about here is being a believer in Christ. You've already been identified to the body of Christ. You cannot even be in that position unless you've already believed. So there is no agenda to take the church from unbelief to belief through the mechanism of the tribulation period. But there is that mechanism in place for the nation of Israel. Why is that? Because today the church is in faith or you're not a part of the church. Today within the nation of Israel it's an unbelieving nation. Keep 
Israel and the church separate because they are on different divine programs. And to mix the two is to mix apples and oranges. This takes us to a fifth question. What is the meaning of the whole world, this time of distress that's coming upon the whole world. Notice again, Revelation 3 and verse 10. Because you have kept my word of my perseverance, I will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is to come upon the whole, adjective in Greek, holos, world, the noun for world is oikumene. Now, there's a big debate about that word oikumene because sometimes when the word oikumene is used in the New Testament, it's not speaking of the whole world. It's speaking of a smaller group within the world. For example, it's used that way in Luke 2 and verse 1 concerning the census that went out at the birth of Christ around that time period. It says in Luke 2 verse 1, over the inhabited earth. It's not talking about everybody on planet Earth. It's talking about a group within planet Earth, a smaller subset, a smaller group. However, that's not the only use of oikumene. Oikumene can be used to describe the whole globe. For example, this is what Satan offered Jesus on a silver platter. Luke 4, verse 5, oikomene was used. Satan, Revelation 12, verse 9, is deceiving the whole world. Oikumene is used again. Acts 17, verse 31, talks about the final judgment of the whole world. Oikumene. So if oikumene means the known world in some contexts, but the entire world in other contexts, which Definition should we insert here into Revelation 3, verse 10. If you don't learn anything else in this church, learn these, learn these words. Context is king. The three rules of real estate are location, location, location. The three rules of Bible study are what? Context, context, context. Words typically have multiple meanings. Take the word apple as an example. I could be talking about a piece of fruit. I could be talking about a computer. I could be talking about New York City. I could be talking about the pupil of one's eye. Which definition do I insert when I'm reading something? The context will tell me. And what is the context of Revelation 3, verse 10? Revelation 3, verse 10 is followed by Revelation chapter 4. Do you agree with me on that? And Revelation 5 and Revelation 6. And what happens in Revelation 6? The wrath of God is poured out not on Rome, not on Las Vegas, not on Los Angeles, not on San Francisco, but the whole world. Oikumene means here the whole world. And beyond that, did you catch the adjective in front of oikumene? It's holos, the whole world. So what is meant by the whole world? Here's the answer. The whole world is meant. And that's why you come to Sugarland Bible Church to get these cutting edge <laughs> insights. It's the seal judgments and the bowl judgments and the trumpet judgments, which as we will be studying them as we move through this series, cover the whole earth. Sixth question. What does it mean when it talks about testing or to test? Notice again Revelation 3, verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will keep you from the hour of testing, uh, parasimos, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test, same root, root now, now it's a verb, parazo, those who dwell on the whole earth. What does it mean to test? Now, in, there's two definitions to test. Here are a couple. It means to demonstrate the quality of something rather than to purify its contents. God is demonstrating who people are rather than purifying them. It also means a test for the purpose of exposing someone's true character, typically with a negative intent to demonstrate a failure. 
That's the definition of test. God is setting up the earth dwellers for failure to expose what's happening in their hearts. Now, when this same verb was used earlier in the book of Revelation, that's exactly what it meant when the church at Ephesus put the test to the test, same word, those who claimed to be apostles and found them to be liars. They were being tested to expose who they are. See that? And this is why this side of eternity, God does not test us in that way. He brings trials into our lives to make us better, not to expose us as failures. James 1, 13 and 14, you'll see it's the same verb. verbs. Let no one, when he is tempted, say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. And, and he himself does not tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. This word test means to be exposed as a failure. This is what Satan does to us. But it's not what God does to the child of God. But let me tell you something. He is going to do that for the unbelievers in the tribulation period itself. Ronald Showers says Christ was declaring that the purpose of the future period of testing will be for God to test them that dwell on the earth to demonstrate or expose the kind of people that they are. You see, when you understand this word test, you start to understand why we can't be here. Because God doesn't treat us this way. He doesn't set us up for failure. He doesn't set us up to expose the fail, failing reality that we are. And that's what God is doing in the tribulation period for the earth dwellers. And you say, well, who are the earth dwellers? Glad you asked. Number seven, who are the earth dwellers? The test is coming for those who dwell on the earth. There's the Greek expression, dwells upon the earth. Every time you study earth dwellers in the book of Revelation, it always refers to unbelievers. The test is not coming for the Christian. The test is not coming for the church. The test is coming for the earth dwellers or the unbelievers. Revelation 13.8 uses the same expression, earth dwellers. And it also says of them that their name is not written in the book of life. They're obviously unbelievers. Same thing in Revelation 17 verse 18. Verse 8, excuse me. Thomas Ice writes, the phrase earth dwellers is used 11 times in nine verses in Revelation. As you examine each individual use, you will see that all refer to a special class of stubborn sinners who are set in their rebellion against the God of heaven. You will also find that the phrase is only used to refer to those during the tribulation period. Therefore, since the future hour spoken of in Revelation 3 verse 10 is in contrast with the present set of believers in the church age, and the future earth dwellers will be active during the time period in which believers are to be said to be kept from, it is clear that John speaks of the time of the hour of the tribulation. That is why Revelation 3 verse 10 is clearly a promise that Christ will keep believers from the time period of the seven year tribulation period. Why is that? Because the whole thing is designed to expose the true nature of unbelievers. It has nothing to do with your trials and your future as a member of God's church. This is why we have to be kept from this whole hour entirely. If God were to insert us into this time period, it would violate his purpose for which the hour comes. You see that? Now, you say, well, gee, uh, pastor, you're teaching escapism. Well, let's think about that for a minute. Is escapism the worst thing in the world? I mean, I'm in favor of escapism. I have no real problem with that. In fact, when I trusted in Christ, you know why I became a Christian when I heard the gospel? I didn't want to go to hell. Isn't that escapism? But people misinterpret what we're saying, and they're saying that in this life it's easy. No, it's not. 
Because in this life we are candidates for trials, the wrath of man, the wrath of Satan, the wrath of the world system. We are candidates for trials, lowercase t. But let me tell you something. According to Revelation 3 verse 10, you are exempt from trial, capital T. You are a candidate for tribulations, lowercase t, but you are exempted from the tribulation, capital T. Why? Because that's God's divine program for the church. In fact, as bad as your life might be right now, this is as worse as it could possibly get for you. That's why Revelation 3 verse 10 which we talked about earlier, the first part of the verse, says, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will keep you from the hour of testing. Why does it insert those together? We talked about how some abuse these verses, but a possible explanation is Christ is saying, you've already gone through your trials. You've already gone through your tribulations. You've already gone through your tests. So because the gamut has already been run on the church, there's no need to insert the church into this time period. Ronald Showers again puts it this way, Christ based his promise on the fact that church saints had already passed their test. In light of that, it appears that because they had already passed their test, Christ promised that he would not put them into the period that will have the purpose of testing a very different group of people. Remember that. The tribulation period is a test to expose as failures a very different group of people, not the child of God. Which raises another question, number eight. What is the meaning of about to come? Revelation 3 verse 10 talks about this hour of testing that's coming upon the whole world and it says there it's about to come. It's the Greek verb mellow meaning about to. It's the same verb used in 1 Peter 5 verse 1 concerning the glory of God which we will share in which is about to be revealed. What is it revealing here? Eminency. This could happen at any moment. This time of testing that's coming upon the whole world could happen in the next split second. That's what he means by about to come. Any moment. It's like a dark storm cloud hovering over planet Earth ready to emit it's rain over the planet at any moment. That's what Jesus is talking about here when he's talking about this hour of testing that is about to come, which raises another very interesting question. How will Christ keep his promise to the church? Number nine. How will Jesus Christ keep his promise to his church to be kept out of not just tribulation of these times, but the hour of the tribulation period that is coming eminently upon the earth? How in the world is Christ going to make good on his promise? What is the means or the mechanism that Jesus will use to fulfill his promise of keeping us free from an hour of trial that's about to eminently explode on planet earth? How's he going to do that? And I'm glad you asked, because the answer is what? The rapture. Because verse 10 is followed by verse what? Verse 11. And he starts to explain the concept of the rapture in verse 11. I am coming what? Quickly. Hold fast to what you have, so no one will take your crown. That's how he's going to do it. He's going to come for us prior to, snatch us out of the earth, rapture, verse 11, thereby fulfilling his promise, verse 10. Now, people look at verse 11 and they say, well, how do you know that's talking about the future? Because it talks about judgment. The judgment of what? Rewards. So that no one will take your what? Crown 
which is the judgment that happens in heaven immediately following the what? The rapture. This judgment of rewards is always connected to the imminent return of Christ. You see that in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Judgment will come when the Lord comes. He will bring to light the things hidden in darkness. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8 talks about a crown of righteousness that Paul will receive on that day. Which day? The day of his what? Appearing. Which is the what? The rapture. You know, it's, it's very interesting to me that about this time of the year, people start putting up Christmas stuff in the department stores. Did you know they're already doing that? And as the months progress, you see more and more Christmas things being put up, Santa Claus, Christmas tree lights, Christmas displays, and you say, you know what? Christmas is coming. But since we're seeing these signs in September, you say, well, wait a minute, Halloween is coming even faster because that occurs in October. And after Halloween, we'll say Thanksgiving is coming even faster because that occurs in November and Christmas occurs in December. Do you see that? When you see the world being pushed in the direction that it's being pushed in, like the desire of the Jews to rebuild their temple, through the discovery of a couple of weeks ago, the red heifer, a genetically pure animal whose ashes must be used to purify the temple. Jim McGowan and myself did a whole pastor's point of view on this on Friday. They're not sure, but they think they've got the genetically pure red heifer, which is a sign for the tribulation temple. See that? And it's a, and by the way, do you think that Donald Trump's movement of the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem is just some kind of random occurrence? How do you build your temple in a city that is being legally disputed by the international community? The nation of Israel has had Jerusalem since 1967, but nobody will recognize it. Trump says, whether Trump understands this or not, I don't know. But God looks down at Trump and says, we'll use him to fix this problem. We'll move the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem is legally recognized, and therefore it's much easier to build your what in a legally recognized city, a temple. And by the way, the Trump embassy move happened exactly 50 years after the nation of Israel regained Jerusalem in the Six-Day War. Now, doesn't your Bible say something about 50 years? Isn't there something in Leviticus 25 about the year of Jubilee, the release of debts? Do you think these things are accident? Do you think the recent genetic discovery of the red heifer, which happens to coincide with all of these things, is just happening sporadically? It's sort of like, you know... I took statistics in college. I wasn't very good at it. We called it sadistics. <laughs> but no one has ever accused me of being a mathematical genius. I'll tell you that much. But it's sort of like, how many times can you, in your life can you be struck by lightning? Eventually, you start seeing these things happen. And you have to start seeing the hand of God in it. And if this world is being set up for the tribulation period and Christ made a promise to us in verse 10, then the rapture must be coming even faster. Question number 10, we'll do these fast. Is this a promise only for Philadelphia? Because they say, well, it just applies to Philadelphia. Well, when you study the Thessalonian letters, I have the verses there on the screen, the letter to Romans, you'll see that the same promise is made to other churches. The exemption from divine wrath is made to the church as a whole. In fact, look down at verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church of Philadelphia. It doesn't say that. The churches. This is a church-wide promise. 
Which takes us to question number 11, and with this we're finished. Does this view, preacher, is this view, pastor, if you're correct in all this, does it harmonize with the rest of the book of Revelation? Or is this just some theology you built from one verse? Well, as you know by now, by studying with us through the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation has three parts to it. Write down the things that you have seen, chapter 1. Write down the things that are the seven letters to the seven churches, and write down the things that will take place after these things. Section 1, chapter 1. Section 2, chapters 2 and 3. Section 3, chapters 4 through 22. How many times does the word church appear in sections 1 and 2? Answer, 19 times. Is it not strange that once you get to the futuristic section of the book, the word church doesn't appear on the earth a single time? Coincidence? No, I don't think it's coincidental at all. I think what we're doing is we're building a theology that is consistent with the totality of God's revelation. Because if I was interpreting verse 10 in a way that contradicted the rest of the book of Revelation, I think I'd be in trouble. But you see, the interpretation that I'm giving is completely consistent with the book of Revelation. In fact, it says in those first three sections, To him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, when you go home today, read Revelation 13, verse 9. Because you'll find the same expression without the clause what the Spirit says to the churches. Why would that clause be used seven times in Revelation 2 and 3, but completely disappear in Revelation 13, verse 9? And you know what? I don't know about you, but when you start studying the book of Revelation, the thing looks pretty Jewish to me. 144,000 Jews evangelizing the world. uh, Revelation 11, two Jewish witnesses that look a lot like Moses and Elijah. Why does God have his hand back on Israel and not the church that he's used for the last 2,000 years? The answer is very simple. We're, we're in the balcony seats. We are those seven golden lampstands that are the church, Revelation 1 verse 20, in heaven when these things happen. Revelation 4 and verse 5. By the way, is anybody here harassed by Satan in your daily life? That's why you've got to put on the full armor, Ephesians 6, of what? Of God. Why is it that in Revelation 12, Satan is not bothering the church anymore? But he is pursuing the woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars. Which is a reference, Joseph's dream, Genesis 37, 9 and 10, to Israel. Does Satan suddenly give up on bothering the church? He's not bothering the church anymore because the church is in heaven. Because we're to be at a time, a place where time doesn't tick. Because we are exempted from the hour of trial that's coming upon the whole earth. Why am I a pre-tribulationalist? Because if God was going to say we're protected through this time period, there are easier ways for him to say it. And by the way, if he's going to protect us through it, he does a lousy job of it. And by the way, that's the meaning of keep you from, and we're kept from what? The hour, the hour of what? The hour of trial that's coming upon the whole earth to test who? The earth dwellers, who are always unbelievers. And it's going to happen this time period eminently which means the rapture is even more imminent. And this is not a promise just to Philadelphia. It's a promise to the church universal, and it fits beautifully with the book of Revelation. So when will the believing be leaving? See, I should have made that my title. Well, we'll do that one maybe next week. When will the believing be leaving? 
before this time period comes. The only real question is, is when the trumpet sounds, are you going? And you say, well, I'm not living holy enough or righteous enough to participate. Welcome to the club. None of us are. This is something that God offers via grace. Unmerited favor. It's part of the grace package that he offers for those who come under the conviction of his spirit and trust in the promise of the gospel. The gospel is good news because Jesus did everything in our place. Died that horrific death, bore the wrath of a holy God in our place, rose from the dead claiming who he claimed to be, and what he says is just trust me. Stop trusting yourself, stop trusting your denomination, stop trusting your good works, stop trusting your New Year's resolutions, stop trusting in what your parents did or your grandparents did, trust in me and the grace package, including participation in the rapture, is available for you. If you want to get saved, you can do it right now. It's not a matter of walking an aisle, joining a church, giving money. It's a matter of privacy between you and the Lord where the Spirit of God places you under conviction and you respond by way of faith, which means trust in Jesus Christ. If it's something you need more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we are grateful for this teaching you've given us from your word concerning what we have in you. I just pray, Father, that we will not fall into modern day confusion, but we will embrace this promise for what it says. And we will live it out this week. Maybe this week is the week you're going to come for us. May our lives be lived accordingly. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said. Amen.